Hello, I'm Brenna Bay, a partner with Edwin Co. Welcome to our podcast series about residential construction. In these podcasts, we discuss matters which arise on residential construction projects. Numerous of the topics discussed in these podcasts are also covered in our guide entitled What to Know Before You Start Digging a Hole, which can be found on our website. I would highlight that the information within these podcasts is general guidance only and may not necessarily apply to your particular situation, since every construction project is different. Therefore, I strongly recommend that you seek professional advice before you undertake any sort of construction project or sign any appointments or contracts. In our last podcast, we commenced our discussion about an employer's key obligation in relation to residential construction projects, paying the contractor for the works. Having previously discussed the price for the works or the contract sum, in this podcast, we will look at the standard payment process using a JCT intermediate building contract as an example. Due to the lack of timely payments within the construction industry, the government introduced the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996. Among other things, the Act requires construction contracts to include specific provisions related to payment, failing which terms are implied into a contract. There are, of course, various subtleties to the Act and its provisions, which are beyond the scope of this podcast. What is important for our discussion is that, by and large, Industry standard forms of contract and appointments contain payment provisions which are compliant with the Act. Therefore, we will talk through the payment process within a JCT intermediate building contract, a form of contract which is often used on residential construction projects. The payment process starts with evaluation of the works undertaken. The parties will agree the date of the first interim payment valuation, often one month after commencement of the works, and thereafter, Valuations will occur on the same day each month. An important date within the payment cycle is the due date. Under the JCT intermediate contract, a due date is seven days after the relevant interim valuation date. Now, the due date is not the date by which payment must be made. Rather, it is the date from which the time frames for payment, as well as for issuing various notices, are calculated. No later than the relevant interim valuation date, the contractor may submit a payment application which states the amount which the contractor considers to be due on the applicable due date. Not later than five days after a due date, the contract administrator is to issue an interim certificate stating the sum which she or he considers to have been due on the relevant due date. The date by which payment must be made, or the final date for payment, is 14 days after the applicable due date. That being said, this time frame is often changed. For example, where an employer has development finance, it can take some time for a payment application to be processed by a funder. Therefore, it may be that the final date for payment is increased to either 21 or 28 days from the relevant due date. If for some reason an employer disagrees with the amount of a payment, and therefore intends to pay less than the sum notified in a payment application or a payment certificate, the employer must serve a withholding or a pay less notice. Otherwise, the amount stipulated within a payment application or payment certificate becomes payable by the employer. If the amount is not paid by the relevant final date for payment, the contractor is entitled to interest on the amount due and to suspend the works and can claim for an amount within the relevant payment application or payment certificate. The contractor might even seek to terminate its engagement under the contract, although typically this only happens where payment problems have existed for some time. Under an unamended JCT intermediate contract, the employer must serve a pay less notice by no later than five days before the applicable final date for payment. While I have simplified matters for the sake of brevity, The important points to note are that the payment process is an ongoing cycle which needs to be managed, and the parties need to be aware of any amendments to the timeframes for valuations, notices, and payments within their particular contract. For employers who have development finance, it is important to speak with the funder to ensure that there is sufficient time between a due date and the final date for payment. Further, If there is any dispute as to the amount of a payment application made by the contractor, it is imperative that a pay less notice is served within the correct time frame. 
notwithstanding that the works can be revalued at a later date. In the absence of a pay less notice, an adjudicator or court will generally find that the sum notified within a payment application or payment certificate is to be paid by an employer before a decision can be made on the true value of the works. Contractors should ensure interim payment applications are submitted in a timely manner. Under certain contracts, such as the JCT Intermediate, the obligation to submit a payment application is not absolute. The provision in the JCT Intermediate states that the contractor may submit an application. In the absence of a payment certificate from the contract administrator, the contractor's payment application will act as the payment certificate, and the time frame for payment will therefore run from the due date. If neither a payment application nor a payment certificate are issued, a contractor can and should submit a late application. However, the time frame for payment of that application will be delayed. Therefore, being on top of its applications ensures a contractor consistency of payment. Finally, both employers and contractors need to take care against entering into contracts which do not conform to the requirements of the Construction Act. Subject to certain exemptions, in such circumstances the Act will imply provisions into the contract, the consequences of which might place a party in an unfavorable position or lead to a costly dispute. In this podcast, we've concluded our two-part discussion on an employer's key obligation in relation to a residential construction project, paying the contractor for the works. We have briefly touched on the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act and how standard form contracts and appointments contain payment terms to comply with the Act. While the timeframes we've discussed are those within the JCT Intermediate Building Contract, the payment cycle comprised of a due date, interim payment application, payment certificate, final date for payment, and the requirement for an employer to issue a pay less notice are generally replicated through all standard form contracts and appointments. Overall, it is essential to all parties to a residential construction project that the contractor and subsequently its subcontractors and suppliers are regularly paid since, as Lord Denning famously stated, cash flow is the lifeblood of the building industry. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and will join us again next time.